Overtime on 91.5 KNSU. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome into the program. It's Overtime with Eric Ryan Solberg, Michael Hozart, and Cortland Taylor. On today's program, we talk Tim Tebow and the Pats. How effective will RG3 be this year? Who will have the best year, Colin Kaepernick, RG3, or Russell Wilson? We'll also touch on A-Rod and the steroids issue. How big of a deal are steroid usage in the MLB, really? We'll also talk some LSU football. Where are they going to stack up in the SEC West? And also, we'll talk maybe on who is the best man. Is it Eli or is it Peyton? We begin today talking about college football storylines. One week from today, the NCAA Division I college football season begins. A uh, game I'm very much looking forward to. The Ole Miss Rebels are in Nashville taking on Vanderbilt. And then, of course, the weekend follows some big games on the docket. LSU in action, of course. And our Nickel State Colonels travel to Eugene, Oregon, and take on the number three team in the land, the Oregon Ducks. Uh, what are you guys most looking forward to about this college football season? Court, man, what uh, you got? You know, the, the usual... Season madness, you know, the, the first couple of rankings, the first couple of seasons, you know, everybody has their number one pick. Everybody's putting Alabama on the board. I want to see a, a nice little change up in the uh, national championship. I want to see a non-SEC championship this year. I think uh, this year I could possibly do it. You know, Ohio State having a good year last year. I think a lot of things can come out of Braxton Miller as he tries to, let's say, uh, improve his, dra his draft stock and things like that. Teddy Bridgewater, a couple of underrated quarterbacks, Taj Boyd. I, I, I like I like underdogs this season. I, I'm feeling the underdog this season. I don't think Alabama's gonna be the, the king of the NCAA Division One championship again like they were the past couple of years. I think there'll be a big change this year. So you're thinking upset? No SEC team uh, in the league, or is gonna be in the championship game. Uh, I, I have to touch on Ohio State. If you look at the Ohio State schedule, they really play no one. I mean, they really they go at Michigan to, to close out the season, but they get Wisconsin at home. They don't play Nebraska. And the Big Ten uh, is a great basketball conference. Right. They're a good conference. Right. They're solid. But they're not the SEC, the Pac-12, the Big 12, uh, really, excuse me, uh, really anymore. Now, as far as storylines go, I mean, we're talking about Ohio State here. As you mentioned, Eric, you know, they do have somewhat of a weaker schedule. Big it, to me, last year, what was interesting about Ohio State is what they were able to do. Granted, Big Ten's been down the last few years. But at the same time, the fact that they're still able to go undefeated in a season with, you know, their best player was a three-star prospect. As far as coming out of high school and as far as talent level is concerned on that team, the Big Ten just isn't getting it done in the recruiting aspect, which is why you've seen the sort of fall off, if you will, when typically the Big Ten has been one of the few conferences uh, in the last decade or so that's been able to compete with those SEC schools, but recently have seen a fall off, but I, I tell you what, if anyone can maybe get it done, I, I just, I think Urban Meyer is one of those guys. I absolutely got to agree, and it's interesting because historically, over the past uh, maybe ten, five especially years, the SEC has absolutely beat up on people in the bowl games. Right. I'm absolutely crushed them. And then last year, you have LSU losing to Clemson. You, you have teams uh, not being as dominant in their bowl games. You have uh, Louisville upsetting an SEC team. You have the, the Mississippi State losing. The SEC's normal pretty sterling bowl record, especially against teams like the Big Ten, right. even the Big East, uh, long live the Big East, rest in peace. Mm -hmm. um, was Sterling, and last year it wasn't that case. So it'd be interesting to see if there's carryover and if the SEC right. is truthfully as dominant as they've been. Right. Um, you know, another big storyline, I think, is some of these young quarterbacks. Uh, Marcus Mariota from Oregon last yeah. year put up those numbers and was one of the best in the country. Uh, I want to see now that teams have a year of film on this guy. Same with Manziel, if he plays, right. pending all the right. sanctions that are going on. But some of these young guys, I'm just curious to see if they can put up those same type of numbers that are in the realm. I mean, asking a guy like Manziel, if he plays, to put up those same numbers, yeah, uh, it's asking for a little much. But if they can keep it, uh, put together strong seasons and keep their teams 
in the hunt for those BCS games. That's what one thing I'm really anxious to see. Well, I'll say this uh, about Manziel. You can't expect him to have the same kind of season statistically, but is he going to find a way to win the football game that he found a way to win last year? I think that, to me, is, is the question. Is Will he be the X factor, or is he going to be the Johnny Manziel that showed up uh, at home against LSU last year through a couple of interceptions? That kind of thing. For me, the big question, though, the interesting storyline will be, uh, is the Pac-12? Is Oregon high? How, you know, they have a new coach, he's the offensive coordinator, but it's his first you know, big-time head coaching job. How much will that transition hurt the team or help the team? And especially in the SEC, how will the new coaches fare uh, in that league as well? But I really think the Pac-12 is more wide open than it's been. Um, last year, of course, it, UCLA found a way to, to have a good season. They get some people back. Uh, Stanford is always a team to watch. They seem to be built to win for the future. Oregon doesn't seem to be going away, but will there be a surprise? Is anybody going to go through uh, undefeated in the Pac-12? I'm, I'm just not so sure. Uh, I don't think anyone in the Pac-12 can really go back, uh, undefeated. You know, just like the SEC, those guys are constantly banging up on each other throughout the season. You know, Stanford and Oregon and all those guys are the Pac-12 championship. Somebody's going to face each other twice, so there's no way anybody's going to go undefeated. But at the same time, I'm anxious to see the Pac-12 actually get on the same level as the SEC, which is what really want to. But you know. Like you, you touched on Stanford. I think going back to Stanford with the coaching change, it's like, you know, uh, Jim Harbaugh, he left to go coach the pros. Uh, coach Shaw, he steps up, doesn't lose a beat, you know? Right. Could, could we be seeing the same thing with Oregon? Hey, who knows? But at Definitely the same time, Jim Kelly, he did the same thing, you know, offense coordinator, head coach, and now it's just a chain of things. So we're going to see if these teams are franchises that's built to win. The long run, are we going to see a fall off or something like that? You never know. But going back to the Big Ten, I know I'm jumping all over, but I like a guy named Devin Gardner because I'm anxious to see what he can do with a full season as a starter. Because you know, Denard Robinson was a little spot put. He was a quarterback, but he wasn't really a quarterback. You know, most people know that. You know, he's just a wildcat type of guy. But I think a lot of teams are starting to fall away from the wildcat, which I'm thankful because the wildcat is just. It, it's a, it's a failed experiment because, okay, you're going to put a guy just to get up going there and to run the football, you're going to crowd the box on you every time. It, it, it's just, I just, I'm down to be a big fan of a lot. Now, Devin Gardner with Michigan, I tell you what, he's got a big arm. Yeah. Um, he's yeah. one of the participants in the Manning Passing Academy this year, and at the air it out, I mean, you could definitely see that he has the arm strength to make those tough throws. And, I mean, those 15 outs we talk about all the time, things like that. Um, and he, he's definitely one of the guys I'm looking out for this year at the quarterback right. position, especially in the Big Ten, because if anybody's going to beat Ohio State, I think it's going to be Michigan. Yeah. Now, going over to the Pac-12, uh, Eric, uh, you mentioned UCLA a little bit earlier. Yeah. Um, the, last year, running sort of, back course, so, so good. Yeah. Now, they did lose Jonathan Franklin to the NFL draft. Right. He's now with the Green Bay Packers, but... Uh, as you mentioned, as a core, that running back group was able to get it done. And definitely a team I'm anxious to see what they do this year. Uh, can they sort of make another run, I guess, if you will. Um, USC, I think, yeah. obviously has the big storyline over its head. Lane Kiffin has definitely not lived up to the expectations he was set to have going into USC. This was his dream job. He left Tennessee after one year. And... Last year, I mean, the ball was on their court. Um, number one in the polls in the preseason. And, you know, going in, uh, I was under the impression that they were going to put up a great season. I was one of the ones who picked them to go to the national championship because that offense they had there, Matt Barkley, uh, they had Robert Woods, Marquise Lee stepped up last year. And then you had Silas Red from Penn State transfer there after all the sanctions came down on Penn State. Um, now, bringing back those guys, they've still yet to name a starting quarterback. Now, you still have Marquise Lee there, and you still have so, uh, Silas Red at running back. So you have some playmakers on that offense. One of the struggles last year, though, was that offensive line. And if Lane Kiffin wants to keep his job, he's got to get that offensive line and fine-tune He's got to work on that defense. So no question Lane Kiffin's on the hot seat. Uh, there, there's no doubt about it. I guess the question is, what does he have to do? Because I mean, we live in a, we live in an era in college football 
Uh, whereas, what have you done for me lately? Where Gene Chizik won a national championship in the calendar year 2011 and was fired in the calendar year 2012. Uh, I realize there's two seasons in between that, but that's the kind of world and era of college football we live in. What is it going to take for Lane Kiffin to keep his job? The national championship seems almost like way too much way of a stretch. Too much. But I mean, I I think he would have to at least finish you know, third and worse in the Pac-12 this year. I think he has to at least advance to the Pac-12 championship. I mean, it's a little far fetched, but at the same time, I think that's what he has to do to keep his job. You had a high profile school like USC, a lot of people, all eyes on you, all of the guys in California, you know those guys looked at you from the East and USC to win the national championship, just like Dynasty years of Reggie Bush and Matt Lyon and right. like that. They want to restore that. They thought Lane Kevin can do it, but I mean, hey, he's either make it or break it this year. You, know, you don't have Matt Barkley, you got two freshmen and a sophomore to be for the starting spot at quarterback. It's going to be a lot for him to take in. Now, USC, in my opinion, if Lane Kiffin doesn't either get a national championship or a Rose Bowl bid, maybe even an at large bid, because typically, how it works, how it works the BCS system works, basically you got the number one team typically goes to the Rose Bowl, the number one Pac-12 team, that is, if they're not at-large for that national championship spot. So if he doesn't at least get an at-large bid for another BCS Bowl, I think uh, I think Lane Kiffin's getting the, getting the chain yanked from him. It'll be really interesting to see. I guess the real question is, that, and going back – talking about the strength of conferences is when it boils down to it, and we haven't even touched on the other team that played for the national championship last year, we haven't even touched on that, uh, you know, whether or not they're going to be even have a chance to be good or not. Um, but, but one thing we, sh- we should mention is, and one thing that has struck me is we can talk about how good Michigan is. And, and do they have a chance to win the Big Ten? Absolutely. But the game that comes to mind when I think of Michigan is how they were absolutely destroyed in that opening game against Alabama at Cowboy Stadium. And so it'd be very interesting to see who, will, you know, the SEC, not just at the top, but has had the most depth of any of any com- conference. I realize at the bottom we've had Ole Miss was a no-win conference uh, a couple years ago. We had Auburn last year, Arkansas struggled, Vanderbilt, Tennessee, Kentucky, Missouri, they've all struggled. But in the top, I mean, the top five to ten teams are just better than any other conference. Do you see a change in that anytime soon? So what do you think? They'll build a super conference now? Or uh, I'm just saying, even if there's a not an SEC team that changes, like, for example, two years ago, you had LSU, Alabama, and Arkansas, one, two, and three. And four. Very often you have three, four, maybe five teams in the top ten, top twelve in the country. Do you see a change in that? Even if there is, like you predicted, Cortland, a, a non- two non-SEC teams in the national championship, do you think they will still be the perennial power conference at the end of the season? I think so. I mean, look, you know, just because a team doesn't win a national championship doesn't necessarily mean it's not the best team in college football because last year, in my opinion, I thought Oregon was debatably the best team in college football, but they didn't get a chance to compete because they had that slip-up. Um, and I think it's happened before. Auburn... In 2004, you had Ronnie Brown, Cadillac Williams, Jason Campbell on that offense, and it was unstoppable. They got snubbed, and USC played Oklahoma. USC was undefeated, I believe, and Oklahoma had one loss, and Auburn had no losses. And they got snubbed. And that just happens with the BCS, but ultimately, I mean, when we're talking about conference as a whole, um, now granted, one thing I talk about all the time with some of the SEC fans in this part of the country, I got a lot of friends who are LSU fans, so they'll they'll talk about the SEC in a sense of it can't be matched, like no other team in any other conference can match up with any SEC school, which I think is false. So don't overstate. Now, granted, do I think the SEC will be the best team by the end of the year? Of course. With or without a national championship, I don't think there's any question. They will be the best conference. But... Don't overstate it, is my point. It's fair enough. Um, it'd just be really interesting to see if they'll continue to have that, that perennial uh, dominance. We're going to step out, take a break. You're listening to Overtime on KNSU 91.5. When we come back, we talk Timmy Tebow and where his role will be with the New England 
Patriots and so much more NFL news. Keep it here on 91.5 and at you.